America's elite academic institutions promise and deliver quite a bit. Academic excellence, access, cultural and intellectual enrichment, and a ticket to the front line of leadership. But those same colleges and universities can also be a place where students find themselves in conflict with the belief in God or any notion of the miraculous. Our guest tonight received one of those educations, and his natural giftings opened many doors. But it's his spiritual journey from what he calls cynical realism to a born-again Christian faith we'll explore in tonight's State of Independence. Stay with us to meet Dr. Miles Hodges next. He's earned degrees from Georgetown and Princeton Seminary, my old school, was a political science professor, launched a university's international studies program, and consulted American corporations. By every standard, Miles Hodges was and is a success. But his biography isn't a straight line. God's providential plan was woven into every step. Eventually, Miles Hodges' story would include assignments as a street pastor and prison minister, pastoring churches in some of the most challenged communities, and in the years when he would normally be retired, he signed up to teach history in French at a Christian school, all while authoring a multi-volume series on American history. It's a story only God could write. He's joining us from his home in Schuylkill Haven, Pennsylvania. Uh, so, Dr. Hodges, welcome to State of Independence. It's great to have you. Oh, yeah, sure. Glad to be here. I, I want to begin with your college experience. In 1959, you enrolled at a Christian college to prepare to uh, answer a call to ministry, but encountered a professor who challenged the whole idea of miracles. What, what did that do to the foundations of your belief in God? <laughs> uh, well, it shattered it, but you have to realize uh, everything was basically Sunday school preparation. I, I mean, my God was an orderly God. I mean, we're talking about the 1950s. My impression as a Christian was that, you know, God's job is to keep everything kind of regular, smooth, orderly. When I got to college, the professor was so intent on stripping scripture of its miracles and to make it even more realistic. My general reaction was, yeah, I mean, that, that's good, but the same could be said, you know, Confucius, Buddha, uh, of Muhammad. So, I mean, where's the significance, particularly if I'm going to pledge my life to the ministry? And I just, and then the next semester, he went off during that spring break and committed suicide in London. You can imagine, it's like, I don't think this is the path I'm supposed to go down. My goodness. But uh, about God, you know, it's funny because I always knew there was a divine hand on my life. I just, it took me years to be able to identify that with the idea of God per se, because, you know, I, I don't even know what the hand was. I just knew that the hand was there. And that's what allowed me to do all kinds of things I would have never done on the basis of just reason. I, I'm, I don't like reason very much. I like commitment and action and risk. And I would have done none of that if I didn't have that hand on my life. And of course, later I realized, well, duh, who do you think that hand always was? Hmm. Now, now um, when, when you were in high school, were you a believer in Jesus? Oh, very much so. Oh, I was the, the moderator, that is Presbyterian terms, the head of the youth organization. I was the moderator of the Presbyteries youth organization of some 50 churches. I was the vice moderator of the Illinois Synod wow. youth organization. So I was, you know, I was very much part of the program. And, and, and so what did you think that God had in plan for your life? And, and, and at the time, what, what did you think the direction, the path of your life would be that where you might be headed? You know, you're, you're obviously, you, you were obviously a, a bright, gifted young man, but where'd you think God, what path did you think God had for you? Well, at, at that point, God disappeared from the picture. What, was, what I found myself at that point was exploring this larger world in the hope that I would find that reason. 
I mean, it took me everywhere. Um, so your, I, your junior year in high school, you went to Switzerland. My is, junior year in college. On, co on college, you went to Switzerland. And you, 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 yeah, you, Geneva. You, you went to... I didn't go to, you know, John Calvin City, but I didn't go to church once. I came back my senior year at the University of Illinois, and I was on the... They wanted me as a student to be on their pastor's council, and I told them, well... It, they said, oh, well, no, you know what? It's just, we're into social action, and you're really good at that. And I said, oh, okay. So I, I was on there. I was the youth representative on the ministerial council. But when I went off to grad school at Georgetown, that was the end of the church thing. I, I wasn't opposed. To, I just didn't see where that belonged in my life anymore. Wow. So, so how do you go from Georgetown to, to Princeton, Theological Seminary. I know there's t time oh. between there, but but what, what happens yeah, in your lot. life that you feel the God's call in your life to to be prepared to minister to people? Um, it was uh, my life was very successful, so much that the success just <clears throat> dried me up. I, it's hard to explain, but after 15. Uh, years of being a college professor, it all seemed so pointless. And I had a real crisis. Um, again, I like challenges, I guess, and I couldn't, I couldn't see, I mean, I was just, it was just to me routine. I, I love the students and all that, but something told me I'm not where I'm supposed to be doing what I'm supposed to be, but I have no clue what that is. And I, I backed out. I backed out of, uh, I took a year, well, I was going to quit the university, but the dean said, no, just take a year's leave of absence. I know the pressure you're under. There's a lot of stuff going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. I went off basically and just kind of hid myself from the world. But some friends, I mean, I didn't like myself very much, but some friends, one was a, a, a young couple that were neighbors up the street. Catholic Charismatics, praying for me, asked me to join them in, you know, in one of their circles. So I did that. It was kind of interesting. And I mean, I, I was never opposed, but, and the woman's name was Stephanie. One day there was a knock on the door and I go and answer it. And there's Stephanie. She says, Miles, I want to tell you something. I was praying and said, the Lord spoke to me. I said, yes, yeah, Stephanie. She said, he, he told me something. Now, promise me you won't laugh. I said, okay, Stephanie. He told me that you're going to become a minister. I'm like, <laughs> whoa, that's the craziest thing I ever heard. But, you know, it was little things. And Martel Scott, a friend that I'd known a long time, a good, strong Presbyterian, invited me. Uh, Boltzmann uh, was, uh, I mean, Brueggemann, Walter Brueggemann, was doing a seminar on crisis at the church that she attended. I knew the pastor because he lived in my neighborhood. And so I went, and that really spoke to me because my life was in crisis. And uh, a girl I was dating marched me off to a cursillo, which is Catholic uh, charismatic uh, renewal weekend. And I thought she, I didn't know what this, I thought everybody was crazy. They were hugging and jumping around. And this was not my idea of Christianity. And this old geezer, greasy kind of guy comes up and tells me he's going to be my spiritual director. I thought, oh boy. As I got to know him, I found out he was an alcoholic. So, you know, he'd been a bishop, an Episcopal bishop. And he was working with throwaway kids under the Pensacola boardwalk. And there was just something about it. I'm beginning to see Christ in, in people. I mean, it's nothing that happened dramatically, but step by step, by step, I'm beginning to understand that God is talking to me through these people. And it's they're not throwing theology at me. They're throwing Christ at me. Well, I mean, you know, in, in a very personal way. And I, I, I wanted to know more of that. I was awakened one night in the midst of a lot of turmoil. It was a vision of me standing in front of St. Giles Cathedral, wearing a cleric's robes, but I think they were French, not American playing the bagpipes <laughs> so, and I knew that was a call that I was that was my last going to be my last year at the university and I was going to go full-time 
I'd already started doing some street work and I thought maybe it was street ministry right there in Mobile, Alabama, but no, it was seminary. And when I found out, I'd been accepted a number of them, that one of the, the, the pastor had thrown a body block across Princeton and, and there, that's why my, they'd been so delayed in, in getting a response of my acceptance. And I realized his very effort to shut me down and then my getting acceptance was sort of God saying to me, that's where I want you to go. And I'm thinking, oh, Prince, oh gosh, I left that world. I'm going back to that. But it was wonderful. Mm. It was wonderful because God let me continue my ministry, uh, street ministry in nearby Trenton. And uh, those street guys taught me an awful lot about what the Christian life can be if you were just relate to people. I, I don't know. I, and I did it for four and a half years before I finally got a call to a pastor. Uh, um, I don't know. Just God shows up in these relationships. Simple as that. That's wonderful. When did that happen? You, well, not obviously overnight. It was a build-up process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's well, powerful. How, how many other students at Princeton Seminary were doing street ministry like you? Probably one other one, guy right? I got guy. to come down and work with me out of the 900. So, so what, would, what, would you, what, what, what would you do when you were uh, doing the ministry? Like you would go down to one of the more hard hit areas of, of Trenton and just make yourself available to people? I had a, yeah, well, the, the church where I was interning had a ministry on the street that ran behind on Hanover Street. Mm -hmm. It got shut down by the police because the previous guy was doing drugs out of it. Oh. No, no, no. And I didn't mean to. I, I just, when the winter came and the guys were hanging around that area, I decided that to open up the church to have some Bible study. I remember one of the guys that was part of my group that I met with, they were all Presbyterian, they were all pastors in the area. When I told him I was going to do that, this one guy laughed at me. He said, some, the moment that you open that Bible, they're going to be a freak out the door. And I said, well, I, I'm sorry, that's how it's going to be. And if, so I, we first started meeting just in the basement of the church. And there were just a few guys that showed up. And no, they didn't run out. They were very interested that I was interested in hearing what their own thoughts were on the subject. Nobody, see, otherwise they were projects. And to me, no, they're people. Let's have some discussion and find out, you know, what where we all are on this walk, you know, you and me, they loved it. Next thing I know, before Christmas, I had 20 guys coming out. Wow. When I came back after Christmas vacation to Mobile, I found out that they'd shut it down in the church. The janitor didn't like cleaning up. Reopened that same uh, storefront on Hanover Street. And so the Hanover Street ministry was born. And I pretty soon I had a congregation of about 100 guys. We... I got Bibles for them. Well, we'd pass them out each day. About only half of them could read, but it didn't matter. We'd read, we'd go through like a, you know, Gospel of Luke or um, one of Paul's letters and, you know, little bit by little bit and just have discussions. They loved it because they weren't projects. They were people. And the fact that there was somebody actually listening to them well, that's Jesus Christ, you know. It's all about relationship. It's not about high theology, proper thinking. Uh, you, you did prison ministry as well, as I understand. I, uh, yeah, a lot of it. But the problem was, and I was doing one left, which is the lockup in Trenton State Prison. But I couldn't, after a while, I was going down every day to Trenton and, you know, and trying to also carry a regular full-time, yeah, you know, yeah. academic load at Princeton. Yeah. So I had to give that up. Yeah, finally. But when I did become a pastor, yeah, I, I got my whole entire church session to get trained for prison ministry. And we started doing prison ministry a lot. Yeah, that, that's yeah awesome. it's the same thing. It's just about showing people that Christ is through relationship. Period. Period. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I love it that you that you uh, were so willing even then as you are now to love your neighbor like you love yourself. I mean, God has had you in all these different positions. You know, I mean, you've worn all these different hats and yet and still the, the one common thread is that God is using you wherever he's placed you. You know, whether, because you, you taught one, one of, 
one of the people here who's behind the scenes, uh, uh, but who's running things <laughs> behind the scenes, was your student <laughs> once upon a time. Yes. And, and, and it was fun to, to find that out, but, but you were teaching history um, yeah. you know, which, at a high school, which is just yeah. you know, wonderful. I mean, so- At half of my pastor's salary, no medical benefits and no pension, and 18 years of that. But you know what? God took care of every one of my economic needs. I put four kids through college in that same time period, paid off the house. Why? I don't know. God just took care of all the details because I was willing to do what he called me to do. And I, by the way, you say I was willing. It was more than, I loved what I was doing. I mean, I, it serving others, as you well know, serving others brings the only kind of happiness the people, you know, trying to chase happiness with money, they're never going to find it. It's in serving others that that the happiness really comes alive. Yeah. Uh, so I was, I was greedy for this kind of happiness, <laughs> <laughs> serving, working with others, yeah. and and it really required nothing other than a lot of times than me just showing up and doing whatever it is, that, just like we're doing right now, just whatever's there to be done. Yeah, yeah. It's really I'm, by the way, I'm enjoying this immensely. <laughs> <laughs> We're enjoying it too. It, it's such a, it's such a well, you know, it's 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 a blessing for everybody watching to walk with you through your life, and to hear how God has used you in all the different ways. Because there are a lot of people who are a lot less imaginative, a lot less uh, open to surrendering themselves to the Lord, and 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 they and they are chasing happiness um, in in from what they see on television. I mean, TV tells you that oh. happiness is, the, is the, the vacation. It's traveling to some exotic place. It's having more money. It's buying a bigger house. It's having another yes. car. It's, you know, they tell you th that's what happiness is. But you seem to have found happiness in, in serving God who, is, who has put a love in you to serve other people, yes. to love your neighbor Absolutely. like you love yourself. And yeah. even with, your, with, your, with your, your wonderful degrees from Georgetown and Princeton, you know, your, your, your joy has been <laughs> whatever serving. Right. Exactly. You, you, you know, that all this stuff is transitory anyway. And, yeah, and, and, absolutely. and, and, and so God has used even your excellent education uh, for his glory and purpose to, to allow you to serve others in all these places where you would, nobody would ever suppose you would be, you know, who would think that somebody who was a professor that gone to these great schools would be doing street ministry. But, but you have the love in your heart to say, you know what? These are people like us. You yes. know, but there but oh, for the grace of God go I. That could be me, you know, standing on that street corner in that position. And, and you just love the folks and spent time with them and talked to them about the love of Jesus. And yes. the same is true in the prison ministry. And the same is true at the high school. And wherever yes. it's been that God has put you, you've been that person, which I think is wonderful. <laughs> well, it is wonderful. <laughs> I've enjoyed every minute of it. And I don't know why I deserved it, but I just followed God's lead. Or I should say I followed Christ's lead because this is specifically Jesus to me. <laughs> yeah, this is this is this is what uh, this is um, how the Lord works. Uh, when we yes. come back, I'll ask Dr. Hodges about his most recent assignment as a Christian school teacher in rural uh, Mooresburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, <laughs> what has he learned from young people who are growing up in Christian families? What are the unique challenges to their faith in this generation? Please don't go away. We'll be right back. You're watching Joe Watkins State of Independence on Lighthouse TV, positively different. Share your comments about today's program in the comment box at joewatkins.org. Dr. Miles Hodges is an accomplished historian, pastor, teacher, political science professor, husband, father, and of course, a follower of Jesus. For nearly two decades after his professional life, he was a teacher at the King's Academy in Mooresville, Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Hodges, what, what did those 18 years in the classroom teach, about, uh, teach you about young people, but specifically Christian young people? Uh, what are they facing today? Uh, how do they see the world? Um, of course, I can't speak for all of them, but, you know, they, they came to understand that the Christian faith is, a, is all about being family. We were family. My kids were there, and through them, um, I had a very special relationship. This was not just academic across, you know, 
um, th this was part of the same dynamic. And, and I think that was probably the most important thing I was able to show them. Uh, well, I mean, we learned a lot of facts, a lot of history. I, I, I drilled them <laughs> crazily uh, to learn things that they would need to know a given perspective on the larger world that we live in. But, but most of all, just the, the ability to, to there, were no, there was no bullying that went on in that school. It really was family. And we all learned together. And we learned to love learning because it wasn't just meeting standards. It was, it was sensing growth. So, so <laughs> what was that? You, you, you've had all these experiences and God has put you in all these different places. In, in this current chapter of your life, um, what do you see God doing uh, with you and through you um, in this current chapter of your life? And I, and I love it that, you know, at no point have we talked about, you know, you retired and you, you know, you're sitting in a, you know, you're sitting someplace, but, but, you know, God is using you even past what many people would consider the age of retirement, which is a blessing. <laughs> yeah. I've retired many times. <laughs> um, well, I've got another book I'm working on. It'll be coming out soon. I'm trying to keep it under 200 pages. It's called Wake Up America. It's this call to get ourselves back on track with the covenant. You know, I, I love this covenant idea. I've written about it constantly. Get ourselves back in covenant with God to, to be the light to the nations, to, to be this thing that America was set up to be, succeeded brilliantly, and, and, and stop wandering off on all these little progressive rational programs. Of, I make the comparison between the reason and truth are not the same thing. Think of two lawyers in front of a jury trying to get them to decide what's truthful in this particular court case about somebody that's accused of stealing. Well, did he or didn't he? Well, it depends on who's the more clever of the lawyers. Well, what does that got to do with the truth of the matter? Well, I don't know how the jury's supposed to decide. Cleverness and the ability to be reasonable does not equal truth. Truth has to be found at a high, much higher basis. And that's through having some kind of continuity with the record. That's how Judaism was formed, is by recovering that narrative of theirs when they no longer had a temple, no longer had an altar, no longer had priests because they're in captivity in Babylon, they reinvent themselves around their narrative. We need to recover the American narrative. Simple as that. Wow, wow, that sounds like it's gonna be some book. What's the book gonna be called? Wake Up America. Wake Up America. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Miles Hodges, you're awesome. You're awesome. Um, tell me about your family. They're all doing great. Um, We've become Pennsylvanians, of course. My son, well, my, my daughter, Rachel, is married to a, a Kosovar who was raised as a Muslim, and now he's a powerful Christian pastor, which is odd because it was Christians that killed his family. But that's another story. So that, And she's getting her doctorate from uh, Oxford in literature. Awesome. My son is uh, a Pennsylvania young entrepreneur of the year. Uh, the governor visited him uh, last October to see exactly if it was grow like business. My uh, second daughter is a big computer person out in Cleveland working offline for a company in Rhode Island. Um, and my son John has just become a marketing chief for uh, the, the county's biggest uh, automobile uh, dealership. They're all doing well and they're of uh, very, very committed Christians yeah, because blessing. it's just part of who we understand who we are. Amen. Thanks so much, Dr. Hodges. God bless you for being Joe, here. Joe, God yesterday. bless you. God bless you. Thanks so much. <laughs> sure. Well, if you want to see an example of someone who is humbly dependent on God's grace every day, you've just heard and seen it from Dr. Miles Hodges. You can find his autobiography and books at thecovenantnation.com or on Amazon. What an extraordinary life and witness. I'll be right back to wrap it up with our great producer, Jeff Coleman. Learn more about Joe Watkins and the mission of this program at joewatkins.net. And tell Joe what you thought about today's program in the comment box.
And now let's talk to our great producer, Jeff Coleman. Well, Dr. Hodges, um, first, when you look at his life, uh, it, there is a one way to look at it, which is he worked really hard, he was really smart, and he had these extraordinary achievements. But then you see the God story underneath, which is so much more interesting, it's a lot messier. But what I loved is that he's talking about seeing Christ in people, yeah. uh, all kinds of unexpected people. Yeah. Uh, people who were in incarcerated persons or people experiencing homelessness. You know, it, it was an array of people uh, that God's voice was flowing through to get him to the ultimate point of saying, okay, whatever you want. You want me to teach a little Christian school up in Schuylkill County and take those kids to France and expose them to uh, the world and culture and teach them how to interact and, and participate as a believer in, in the world? What, what an incredible life. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just so encouraged that he didn't allow the world to take over him, you know, that he wasn't so mm. blinded by the, the, the big degrees from the, the access the, and the, the schools and the access that he just said, Lord, that's all I'm going to do. But rather he said, no, Lord, take me where you will. I mean, you saw the point, right, when you said, you say Princeton and Georgetown degrees and he just, he chuckles. Yeah, that's right. Right, because he knows that it's, it's fleeting, that it's dust that there's nothing significant about the world's trophies that they can offer. And uh, now uh, in his early 80s, still looking with energy at the next project, not retiring from the calling of, uh, of introducing people to, to Jesus. And, and he also said something that was kind of interesting. He said, you know, we talk about God, you can be pretty general and vague when you talk about faith uh, or God, but he said, I'm, we're really talking about Jesus here, an actual person, and that really makes this conversation so important because that's what we're talking about. Yeah, it's amazing that God has stuff for him to do even now. Oh, yeah. yeah. If, if, if you say yes. Yeah, 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 that's wonderful, wonderful. Well, it's not always a given that if a school is labeled Christian or has a Christian mission on its website, they're faithful to the scriptures. In fact, more often than not, they sadly fall short. If you're paying for your kids and grandkids to experience a Christ-centered edu educational experience, do your homework. No, not the political issues of the day, but how they view God and our relationship and responsibility to Him. And then pray. Ask God to give you and that student discernment and even courage to take a stand, even in the face of academic peer pressure. When they do that, they're not doing it alone. Between now and when we meet next, stay encouraged. Trust God, believe in His promises, because He never fails. From America's very first capital, Philadelphia, I'm Joe Watkins. For Jeff Coleman and the team behind the cameras at Lighthouse TV, thanks so much for watching. God willing, I'll see you next time. Joe Watkins' State of Independence is a production of Lighthouse TV, positively different. Made possible in part because of the support of viewers like you.